Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 24th edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Start at the start. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin, for anybody who hasn't joined us before. Um, I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. I just say compliance and disclaimer. Uh, just some quick housekeeping, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. And um, for anyone who hasn't joined us before, the structure of the webinar is we generally run these every fortnight. Um, over the hour, we have two companies come in and present their story. So each company gets 30 minutes, which we break down into a 20 minute presentation, and then we leave 10 minutes open for Q&A. If you have any questions for either of the companies this morning, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function, just makes it easier and more efficient to manage the, the Q&A when we get there. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted in, on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. So if we skip over something, our particular presenter skips over a slide uh, a bit too quickly, you can go and re-watch it tomorrow. And obviously you can also get all the previous morning meetings on there as well. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at CMicrocaps. As I said, YouTube for this recording and the recordings of all previous webinars. Uh, LinkedIn, where I do some additional long form content. I also write a weekly paid newsletter, which you can find on the Substack subscription platform. Uh, our first presenter this morning is Dr. Herman Arango, co founder and CEO of iMexis. And then we're going to have uh, Phil Nickel and actually Stephen Mundy, the CFO from Paragon Care, join us. So I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to our, our man. Let me just stop sharing. Our man, if you can uh, get your screen up Thank now. You. Sure. Thank you very much, Mark. One second. I will upload my press. Okay. Any reason? Um, sorry, Mark, but for any reason, he's not allowing me to to share. Yeah. Okay. I'm just double checking your permissions, for man. Yeah, it says you. Yeah, but no, it seems to be a matter of my device. Oh, your device. Um, okay. I yeah, I think. Well, it would be better if you can can start with uh, with Phil because I would probably need to restart. You probably need to restart. Um, Phil, Stephen, do you want to? Uh, uh, are you guys able to to jump in in this half an hour session, and we and we come back to her man? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's great. Uh, so we're sorry about this. Thank uh, you, Mark. We'll have a slight reversal of the order. Uh, <laughs> so we'll have um, Phil and Stephen now from Paragon Care kick off for this first session. Okay, I can see the, your uh, cover slide presentation now, guys. So you, you are good to go. Right. Thanks very much. And, and thanks for your time, everyone, this morning. Uh, I'll, uh, Stephen's going to be driving the slide, so I'll walk through the deck with him and just ask him to move each slide as I get to it. So um, on the second slide, Stephen, if you go back. I'll try. Uh, no worries. <laughs> oh, there we go. All uh, right. Yes. So, so good morning and, and thank you for joining us this morning. Before I start, I'd just like to give you a bit of an overview about Paragon, uh, who we are and what we actually do. So Paragon's one of the largest and most established uh, providers of medical supplies and equipment to the healthcare and hospitals, aged care facilities across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the majority of our businesses is rep representing manufacturers who don't have a uh, direct presence in uh, Australia and New Zealand. 
So we work with them. We actively look for, look out for and source technology from all over the world. Uh, and we're often approached almost daily to represent companies. So we, we either actively look to source product or we're approached and then we work with the companies to provide a full range of sales, marketing, um, regulatory, uh, logistics, service maintenance across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we have scale and relevance, which is very important in our space. And we have over 400 staff representing all those functions across Australia and New Zealand. So this is uh, very hard to do for a company wanting to set up from scratch and we can accelerate that journey by anything from two to three years, depending on the regulatory complexity. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. So Paragon represents over 100 very well-known brands across Australia and New Zealand and have long-standing relationships with the, in many cases, with the companies that we represent. Brands like Microport, Hoya, BK, Avanos, Conmed, such as those. The Paragon um, company is made up of a group of companies that Paragon has acquired over the years. And that's really the heart and soul of what we do. Um, these companies, with the acquisitions of these companies, uh, comes through a really long-standing relationships with some of the key decision makers. So, for example, I was um, I came with the company Surgical Specialties. I was one of the vendors of that business, and I've been in that that particular space for you know 25 plus years. So, a lot of the customers that we're dealing with are customers that I got to know very early in my career, and they've progressed and are now you know professors or key decision makers. So that helps us give access to the newer members of the team and, and, and has helps us um, do what we do. And that could be said across all the brands within the Paragon group. So, you know, Immulab, Designs for Vision, uh, REM Systems and the like. And then through that, um, through those companies, we basically have access to all the key healthcare facilities, aged care facilities across Australia and New Zealand. Next slide, please, Stephen. Within those group, we've we've divided or, or arranged them into what we call our pillars. So four different pillars. Uh, the pillars are devices. So devices include products like hip and knee replacement, uh, intraocular lenses, eye care products, and capital equipment. Then we have the diagnostics products, which is uh, blood testing products. We also manufacture uh, COVID test kits more recently. We have our capital and consumables pillar. And in that we have things like ultrasound equipment, lithotripsy equipment. And then with those capital equipment comes an ongoing consumable range to support them. And then we have our service and technology pillar, which is uh, we have a, a, over 60 engineers across Australia and New Zealand that service and maintain the equipment that we sell. And we also, uh, provide OEM service capability, service capability for OEMs that don't have that capability. Within that group, we also have a company called Total Communications, and Total Communications provides patient monitoring systems in the aged care sector. Next slide, please, Stephen. So we see our clear competitive advantages to be a, a, a combination of all the things I've just gone through. So we have very much have the customer at the center of our focus. And through our network, we can work with them to identify and source innovative technology from anywhere in the world. And we're not beholden to one uh, master um, manufacturer. And, and we in fact compete with the, with the big international manufacturers who, who don't have a direct, who have a direct presence, I should say. In some instances, we also manufacture products. As I mentioned, we, uh, we are manufacturing COVID test kits as well, and, and our blood reagent products is, is our own IP. Uh, we're very well diversified, so that means we're not reliant on any one or two products, which is a very deliberate um, strategy. And we, we can offer our one customer a very broad range of supplies to simplify their, um, their buying processes. Next slide, please, Stephen. The market we operate in through the current portfolio is estimated to be around $4.4 billion. 
and our market share is in the in the low to mid single digits. So we've got you know very small share in a in a large opportunity. And we also have the benefit of the tailwinds of that uh, of the demographics, so an aging population and increasing incidence of chronic disease. So all those things are in our favour. So our we see a real opportunity to to grow through organic growth within the market and also taking market share. Next slide, please, Stephen. Between 15 and 18, the Paragon went through a very rapid growth cycle, acquiring 17 different companies through that time. In between 19 and 20, the focus then became on uh, more about integration. And with that integration came some challenges. So one example would be trying to get all those companies onto one ERP platform, which uh, was problematic. But in recent times, uh, probably the last 18 months, since um, Stephen and I have been on board, we've, we've very much worked through the majority of those issues. There's still a few that we're, we're finishing off, but we're now very much focused on leveraging the assets that Paragon has acquired over those years and then more towards a growth agenda. We've also been very um, focused on eliminating duplication and becoming more efficient. So there was a lot of low hanging fruit there. We've, uh, we've worked through a lot of that. There's still some to go, but we've, it, you know, an example, we've been able to uh, take $7 million annualized savings out of the business just through some elimination of duplication. So some good progress there. Next slide, please, Stephen. We've got a, a well-balanced board. So we have our, our chairman has been around since the founding of the company. And more recently, um, we've had uh, Paul Lee join the board. Uh, Paul is a, a director and also uh, chairman of a company called Pi China Pioneer, who is a major shareholder within Paragon Group. Next slide, please, Stephen. Uh, Stephen and I came into our roles in uh, just towards the end of 2019. Um, we have a market cap around 82 million and an enterprise value of around 159 million. So I'll now hand over to uh, Stephen to run through what we feel are some very good half year results and very happy for him to walk you through those and share them with you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, what we'd like to do is highlight to you um, four, four um, key numbers for us um, that uh, really are the difference this, in this half year to what's been happening in the last couple of years. And the, the, for us, the message is focused around that we're actually starting to deliver those things um, that have come out of all the hard work. So um, a good example of that is right through COVID, in, in a in a a market that's been severely disrupted. So for all our elective surgery products, um, there's been disruption through the lockdowns. Uh, probably most significantly impacted was our aged care um, um, business, which uh, eff effectively came to a halt and has remained that way for quite some time. But because of the diversified portfolio that um, Phil was talking about earlier, we've we've maintained our revenue. So we're at 115 million dollars worth of revenue for this first half year and last year that was 120 so it's it's actually a a, a a stable revenue given the environment that we've worked in what that's allowed us to do is generate 14.7 million dollars worth of EBITDA which is a significant increase on the prior year 63 percent up um, that's that's something that's been able to be built uh, by maintaining revenue and margin and then delivering those cost savings, those, um, those uh, efficiencies uh, through, the, through the process of re removing duplication and getting rid of some of the, um, the additional facilities that we've acquired by acquiring all those businesses. So that's now delivered us um, $14.7 million EBITDA for the, for the first half. Uh, that's also enabled us as a base then to deliver $15.5 million worth of operating cash flow. 
Um, that, that operating cash flow is $24 million up from the prior year. And simple mathematics will tell you that that means in the first half year of last year, we actually went into negative operating cash flow. Uh, and that was because of indigestion, as we've, we've labeled it in that other slide, um, of bringing all those businesses together. So the, the ERP difficulties that were entered in, that, that were incurred, um, generated some problems around working cash flow cycle. So our working cash flow cycle blew out a little bit last year. We've been able to manage that back in by reducing debtors days, by reducing our inventory. And so overall, we've taken nearly 30 days off our operating cash flow cycle. That enables us to deliver cash flow from good, strong earnings. The net result of that is we start to bring down our net debt. Um, and as a, as a reasonably geared business, um, net debt is something that we are driving down. So, so by maintaining revenue, by delivering cost savings and therefore making that revenue generate earnings, that being managed well through our working capital um, cash flow cycle allows us to bring our debt down. And that's, that's the, the key messages uh, from the first half results. It's delivering on what the, the, the company put in as design to ensure its, its um, growth and prosperity. What we've then done is gone into some detail in the profit and loss balance sheet and cash flow, um, probably more detail than we've previously done, but it was in, we think it's important for transparency, um, given where the company's been, that everyone can, can easily pick apart our numbers. And just, just picking on a particular uh, line, for example, uh, if you look at the employment benefits um, expense, that's come down $5 million, half on half. Um, 3 million of that was JobKeeper. And by, by receiving, it's a little under 3 million, but by, by receiving JobKeeper, we were able to maintain most of our employees. In addition to that JobKeeper benefit, we still reduced our employment benefit expenses by a further $2 million. And that wasn't simply through a, a mass um, a retrenchment program. That was through managing our, our casual employees, through managing our contractors who were converted into permanent employees. So there's a whole um, business as usual uh, review of how we operate. Um, employment's one example. The marketing and other expenses are also significantly down. You'll see that we've had some distribution and occupancy costs increases. And that's some of that is simply around COVID. We've done the same thing, uh, provided the same sort of information on the balance sheet, which allows you to actually see the, the receivables down by 6 million, the inventory is down by 2.6 million. You'll notice our trade and other payables are still being managed at the levels that they, they were at. And what that's done is delivered us cash. So you, you can see the calculation we've given you there of our working capital cycle from 161 days down to 133 days. Um, and again, all of this is being uh, presented this year to try and allow people to delve a little deeper into our numbers. One of the things that was done, uh, you'll see that we're running at the moment at accumulated losses from history. Uh, we've pulled the half year profit out and put it into a dividend reserve, um, signaling that uh, when the company is able to pay dividends, that we'll have a dividend reserve to pay those monies out. Uh, and that's a, a, a high focus of the board to get back to um, having a yield on, on, this, uh, on, the, on the shares. Um, again, with the cash flow, you can see uh, the two big numbers there. The first number, the operating cash flow. The second number that's important is that uh, money spent in investing activities. They, they are the, the, the final payments required for those earnouts uh, in, in the businesses that we acquired. And all of that was funded out of our actual operating cash flow. So we've not had to increase our borrowings to complete those acquisitions. Um, that, that was always the design and it's very pleasing to see that we, we actually lived up to that. Th this slide is to give you some more color around uh, what actually happened with our revenue in the first half. And what you can see is there's some, some parts of our business that uh, were down, uh, the, the largest, the largest impact was in service and technology. Uh, that, that is because that's where our aged care business sits and that, had a, that, that has and, and, and continues to have uh, significant headwinds against it until we pull through COVID uh, and, and the aged care sector opens up more broadly. But the important message here again is revenue stability through the diversified product portfolio that we have. 
It's diversified in product, but it's also diversified across Australia and New Zealand. So Australia was more impacted by COVID because we had more lockdowns. So you can actually see that in New Zealand, we've, in, we've grown because there were, there were not the impacts of COVID over there as there were in, in Australia. This is a little bit more flavour on operationally what we were doing to deliver those $7 million worth of annualised savings. Um, it, it re it's, it's hard to describe them in terms of the simple outcome because there's still more to come. It's also hard to describe them because it's, it's, been, a, um, it's been a complete um, reinvigoration of the management team um, and a, a, a conversion from focusing on um, trying to save costs to trying to make the business more efficient and giving us a platform for growth in the future. So um, we've, we've provided that again so that you can go through and if you like, ask questions specifically about some of the things that we've uh, gone through and achieved. The final slide here is um, what we call a waterfall. Uh, most people are used to those. Uh, it's between last, the, the first half last year's earnings and the first half this year's earnings. It breaks down into big chunks those things that have occurred. So you can see um, we've had some impacts that have negatively impacted on us. The reduced uh, gross profit, reduced GP as its headline, um, is from lower sales and that's where we've been impacted by COVID. But you can also see where the cost savings have occurred. There's a big ticket item there, JobKeeper, but there's also those other savings, the employment cost savings, consulting, travel and marketing. So again, this is to provide as much information as we can, allow you to peel back um, the, the, the headline numbers uh, and, and, and if you like, ask, ask questions. So I might hand back to Phil to now have a, um, a, a touch on the, the outlook for the company in the future. Thanks very much, Stephen. So our focus now is very much on uh, organic growth, so organic growth through the assets that Paragon has acquired in the group of companies, and also continuing to improve our operational efficiency to improve our profitability. And we're also beginning to see the benefits of cross-selling across the group. So um, the companies are now operating far more cohesively, and with that becomes uh, sales leads effectively between the different reps in the different companies and different divisions. So that's something we're actively promoting. And it also, you can do that internationally between Australia and New Zealand. So some of the products that we represent in Australia, we're expanding into New Zealand and vice versa. So we're, we're leveraging the experience across the group and sharing best practice to become um, more efficient. We're also looking at acquiring new agencies and all of that means that the agenda now is very much focused on growing the business as opposed to you know, managing through some of the challenges that we'd faced in prior years. We still have, um, we're well advanced in those and uh, we're, we're still have more benefit to see from those. Next slide, please, Stephen. So in summary, we feel our revenues for FY will be in line with FY20. We're continuing to gradually improve our margin going forward. Um, over time, we'd like to get back to a 15% EBITDA ratio. And as Stephen mentioned, uh, there is uh, the reinstatement of dividend is a high priority for the board as and when we're in a position to, uh, to do so. So I think that's the last slide. I think we can uh, park it there and um, Mark and open up for questions. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions, guys. Um, so I'll try and rattle through them. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, do First one, do the OEM brands pay distributor bonus payments for hitting sales targets like is common in IT distribution? So there's the question, I'm just reading that one now, the OEM brands. Uh, it depends on the different arrangement, not typically. We, we typically manage that through our incentive schemes for our sales reps. That being said, um, <clears throat> depending on the arrangement, there can, there can be 
additional um, in-market support or demo equipment or, or product that um, can be contributed through, through driving sales or hitting agreed targets. Okay, great. Um, and one of us actually emailed in ahead of time. I've got a few emailed ahead of time. But um, uh, is there a plan to rebrand all the acquisitions to a standard Paragon care brand so you've got a uniform image and identity? Over time, but at the, at the moment, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, within the respective industries or, or sectors that each company operates in, those brands are very well established. And that's part of what Paragon acquired through the acquisition. So depending on the, on the space, um, if I take orthopedics, for example, where, where I've come from, the, what we've done is we've, we've, we've raised the profile of the Paragon brand within the orthopedic community, which was otherwise not known. And over time, that's becoming more and more um, known and uh, and we will you know we can taper off um, the, the the particular brand that that company uh, surgical specialties for example but there's no um, it's just really what makes sense at the time and what's really going to give us the best impact with our customer okay great and then uh, revenue concentration within your top three suppliers how much would they represent uh, maybe this one for Stephen how much would they represent of total revenue your your top three OEMs um, yeah so look none, no single supplier represents um, even close to 10% of our revenue so across the, the top three you, you probably um, it, it would be more than 20% but less than 30% and that that obviously changes uh, depending on the, the particular time in the year that you are looking at, because we have different cycles. Again, because of the diversified portfolio range, range there is different annual cycles. But no, no, no uh, supplier is, is of um, that significant uh, a value to us uh, that they, they, they have any, um, we are in any way dependent upon, on them. Uh, and the top three suppliers at any one point in time over a cycle uh, would not represent more, uh, they'd represent more than 20, but not more than 30%. Okay, great. And then another one that was emailed in ahead of time. What's the typical uh, contract length with the OEMs, either by pillar or maybe ac across the group? They typically range from, you know, three plus years. Uh, that being said, a lot of them have, you know, been around for, you know, 10 plus years, even longer. So once you, you get established um, and you're doing a good job, it becomes very sticky. So often the, the agreements are, are put in the drawer and, and not really referred to that. There might be a reminder or they, or they have an automatic renewal. I mean, that doesn't happen with all the cases, but you know, the successful brands within, and that's what Paragon has acquired. There's longstanding relationships and, and they're built through performance. So, um, the actual agreement would be anything from three to five years, but typically in a, in a well-running um, distribution agreement, it just keeps rolling over. Okay. And what is the market dynamics in healthcare distribution? Do the OEM brands use a combination of a, a channel partner like you and direct sales, or do they either go one or the other? It varies. The, the big guys, typically the big, well-established multinationals um, would typically go direct. But that being said, in some of the um, uh, smaller, more remote geographies, they might go through an agent. But I think it would be fair to say the majority, they're either direct or they go through a, a distribution um, channel like us. Okay. And then another question that was emailed ahead of time to me. Um, is this person can't join us, but I think they're going to watch it back on YouTube. Uh, is uh, maybe one for Stephen, I think, Behar Suhid. Is there a target debt level that you're trying to get to Stephen? You know, 3x net debt to EBITDA or, or some absolute net debt level? Yes, so um, we don't have an absolute um, debt level target because the, the business is continuously <laughs> growing and, and we, we anticipate we will continue to grow. Um, so we, we generally like, to have net debt um, and we carry a bit of cash because of the spread of our geographies um, and, and the, the, the diversity of the business. 
Uh, but the net debt, we like to try and get back down to, let's say, two and a half times um, EBITDA. Um, that's 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 where where the business uh, has uh, good, comfortable um, uh, leverage. So it benefits shareholders to the leverage. Uh, but the net debt isn't a, a, a burden. Um, that 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 target will be achieved both through growth and through the cash the cash being generated, which brings our net debt down. And that's you know, that that has occurred over the last twelve months. Okay, great. And um, we're just coming up exactly under half hour now, so I think we we leave it there. Uh, Phil, Stephen, thank you uh, very much for joining us this morning. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to get in touch, um. Shane's details and Phil's details have been have been up there, and uh, we'll switch back now. Uh, Stephen, if you can stop stop sharing, and we'll see if uh, uh, her man can uh, yes. can uh, try and share his screen this time. Uh -huh. Yes, thank, thanks very uh, much, Mark. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Phil. Her man, I can see your cover slide now, so I think we're we're good to go. A second okay. time. Okay. Yeah, no, apologies for that. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and good morning, everyone, and I'm pleased to join you today. I'm XHS is an innovative provider of medical imaging software that is designed to deliver better outcomes for doctors and patients by improving productivity and reducing healthcare costs. I am one of the co-founders of the company, which was established in 2012 to solve a specific problem. Uh, we had a contract to take images and scans at a clinic in the Amazon jungle, but there was no radiologist available. And the bandwidth was only 250K. At the time, the only solution was to develop a teleradiology product ourselves that could be delivered over the internet. And this became the core of our Hiruko platform. Since then, we have expanded to cover more than 250 sites across 15 countries. Over 2,000 radiologists now use our imaging solutions, which are developed by software engineers based in Colombia. Last year, we entered the US market, which represents a significant opportunity, and we have operations in Spain and Australia as well. Turning to some key elements of our business, the majority of our revenue is recurring, reflecting our subscription model, which is based on multi-year contracts. Our customer retention rate is over 95%, and we have never been displaced by a competitor. Our Hiroko platform provides customized solutions for all complexity levels, from small clinics to large hospital networks. Last May, we launched a standardized radiology solution called Aquila in the Cloud, which provides small to medium-sized customers with a low-cost medical imaging solution. It has generated a strong interest, and in less than a year, has contributed over 1.2 million in ARR. We also have several distribution channels and are developing AI tools from our large database of stored images. This slide shows that we have multiple runaways for growth, which includes our customized Aquila product offering and our new Aquila in the cloud standardized radiology solution. We also have developed other medical verticals such as Alula for pathology and Anteros for cardiology and are exploring other verticals, other verticals such as dental imaging. In addition, we will drive growth through expansion into new markets such as US, Brazil, and Europe. This slide shows our HUCO platform, which consists of a picture archiving and communication system and a vendor neutral archive, an enterprise imaging system, which customizes a specific workflows for different clinical departments, and advanced post-processing elements, which are our most sophisticated layer. The platform also integrates advanced visualization tools from third parties, such as Viral, which are available in the cloud for the first time via our platform. 
Hiruko also provides management functions such as scheduling and billing and can measure the metrics of a business and produce statistics in real time. This slide shows our new business model, Aquila in the Cloud, which continues to generate a strong interest and provides a small and medium-sized customers with a low-cost medical imaging solution. Launched in May, it is highly scalable business model that is supported by an extensive and growing network of distributor partners. By 16 March, we had signed 54 deals for an ARR contribution of 1.2 million. Most of these deals have come through our distributor partners and three customers are located in the US. We offer our Aquila in the Cloud customers three packages which differ in terms of features and functionality as well as price points. We already have customers moving to higher tiers and in the future there will be cross-sell opportunities as we add for their tools. IMEX HS distribution model is based on a combination of direct sales and distributor partnerships, which forms part of our low risk go to the market strategy. In April 2020, we announced our inclusion on Ingram's micro cloud global marketplace, which provides another distribution channel, which is disruptive and scalable and will assist in selling to customers in rural and remote areas. We also provide radiology services for a small number of contracts to access images for training algorithms and AI data sets. As a result, we now have a library of over 900, 940 million images and have developed an AI tool for detection of viral pneumonia and another one for natural language processing. Turning to our FY20 result, we were very pleased to report a strong growth across our key financial metrics, both on a reported and constant currency basis. Sales revenue of 10.9 million was 41% higher year on year and 59% higher on a constant currency basis due to new contract wins and renewals. Importantly, this was in line with the FY20 revenue guidance we provided during the year. Our EBITDA loss of 1.3 million improved by 3.3 million year on year and IMEX HS is in a sound financial position with closing cash of 10.8 million at 31 December 2020. This slide show, shows that uh, we recorded 33% growth in ARR on a constant currency basis, reflecting contract wins and renewals. This strong result was despite the ongoing pandemic, which affected decision making by some larger operators. We are well placed to benefit from a number of macro trends in the healthcare sector. And as I mentioned, we have multiple runaways for growth, including the development of other medical verticals and AI capability, as well as the extension of our global footprint. Turning to our 2021 development roadmap, we have a number of key priorities. We will enhance our Aquila platform with a new version 4.0 to provide a broader product offering to potential customers in the US and Australia. We will create the Alula marketplace, the world's first pathology marketplace, and develop other medical verticals, including a dental imaging and veterinary information systems. Finally, we will use our rapidly growing image library for training and testing AI algorithms. Looking ahead to 2021, we will continue to focus on expanding into new markets and converting the strong interest of our Aquila in the Cloud offering. We now have the certification to build on our business plan for Brazil with two new distributors in place and plans to develop a new office. We are on track to achieve EBITDA break even on a monthly run rate basis by December 2021. In summary, IMEX HS is an innovative medtech company with disruptive business models 
that meet the needs of a small to mid-sized customers with a cloud-based medical imaging solution. Importantly, we are also competitive in delivering outstanding customized platform to the largest and most complex operators. We are growing rapidly across multiple geographies, including the world largest market, the USA. And I will now hand back to Mark for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Armand. Yeah, we've got a, a few that were sent in ahead of time, kind of like the last presenter and uh, ones that have come in, come in live now. So let me start maybe with um, one that came in ahead of time first. Uh, just on the new verticals, it, it's around the, the dental and, uh, and the vet verticals. Um, the, the question is, are you replacing like a medical platform that has just been, I guess, used by vets uh, and dentists uh, with a platform that's specifically designed for their needs? So, you know, they've taken something from human healthcare in the vet space, but nobody's actually ever developed a, a vet centric platform. Is that the plan there? Well, Mark, uh, the. Um... The plan in that regard is to create a specific uh, software platform for managing the workflows of the imaging in those two uh, environments, the dental and the vet. Uh, we, we are taking obviously advantage of our existing technology, but what we are creating is, is a specific platform for handling images in those scenarios. Um, because as you mentioned, uh, yeah, and it's very accurate. The the uh, the way the 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 practice in those fields has been happening is that they have been using human medical software platforms to replace or to cover their necessities. We are attempting to cover a gap uh, and a particular and a specific requirement of those uh, fields of the practice. Okay, perfect. Um. On the Aquila in the cloud deals, um, gross margins in that business, similar to most software as a service businesses, or what are you targeting from that business? Well, uh, Aquila in the cloud is, um, is a business model plus a, a, a disruptive technology. The only way to deliver this business model is uh, having a specific architecture and a specific technology design. So uh, taking advantage of the cloud architecture and uh, of the multi-tenant architecture of our platform, we have developed a specific, very standardized software platform to deliver a standardized offer based on a subscription model to our customers. This is dedicated to the low end and mid end to the market. Uh, which is more or less underserved and, on, and non attend by the existing providers or by the main brands in the world. Uh, is a huge segment of the market and um, our solution uh, is filling very well this gap. Given it's very standardized, the scalability of the business model is very high and the efficiency of the technology is also very high, delivering or, or, or resulting in very good margins and, very go, and, a, and in a very good financial structure. The margins in, a, in this business model for us are more than 80%. Um, and uh, as soon as the customer increases the volumes or jumps into new packages, into more advanced packages or starts doing uh, acquiring additional services from a cross-sell perspective, the margins may increase. We are also working in improving these, uh, the cost structure to even go into more optimized margins, but by the moment we have more than 80% gross margin. Okay. Uh, and then another question on uh, Aquila in the cloud. Um, early sales traction has been very uh, promising, as you pointed out on that slide. Uh, the question is, do, do you accept or expect it to kind of continue with this, like kind of 50 to 60 deals a year, or do you expect it to increase from here now that, you know, it's getting a bit more well-known in the market and people, uh, people are more aware of the product? What's your kind of feel on yeah. take-up going to be going forward? 
the, well, the, our expectations on on uh, on on killing the cloud are very very positive, very optimistic. Since we launched this in May, it has been a bit more than six months, and we have been able to deliver 54 new deals. Um, and uh, and to deliver this number of deals, the size of the pipeline behind has to be growing in the same proportion. So with the trend. Uh, we are we have uh, the, the growing trend we have in our pipeline and the growing trend we have in the actual delivery of of uh, signed deals we expect these to keep growing in the same direction but uh, definitely it has to be more than uh, 50 to 60 deals per year by far more is our expectation so uh, we're not providing guidance on on this regard but what i can say is that given the traction the pipeline is getting and the actual delivery in the way it's happening, we expect to to to, uh, to keep this trend, which is uh, uh, logarithmic. Okay, I think yeah, the, I've got another question here that was emailed in, uh, it's probably similar. The, the pipeline was previously reported as 100 opportunities in September and then 175 in December. Um, I'm guessing that has increased now based on, on what you just said. Definitely, Mark. I, we are not providing at this point uh, guidance on on, on, uh, on that regard. So, But what I can say is that definitely has been growing. And in fact, a demonstration of this is the actual number of signed deals, because if the pipeline is not uh, is not uh, as big or big in the same proportion, there is no way to deliver such amount of new deals. Okay, and then um, Equilla in the clouds ha has a bit of first mover advantage uh, and it seems like implementation is pretty straightforward. The question is, does this imply that there's the switching costs are low for, for people who take it up or what would prevent competitors from releasing a, 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 a similar product to, to compete with um, Aquila? Sure, very good question, Mark. They definitely. Well, the, the details behind this model uh, are, are very relevant. So this is a multi-tenant multi -tenant cloud and native platform, uh, which means that we, we only require a single real installation in the cloud. And for each new customer, the only thing we have to do is to create a new tenant and do the integration with the modalities. This is a pretty simple step or process, which uh, allows us to be very efficient in the deployment process. Given it's very standardized, we don't have to go through a customizing uh, process, which uh, is a source of, the, of, of, of regular delays. In this case, it's very standardized, three packages, then the, the decision uh, process for the customer is pretty simple, and the deployment is even more simple. In terms of the post-sale support, given we have a centralized uh, installation uh, with, this, with this architecture, uh, or deployment, the post-sale support is also very efficient. On top of that, this, uh, the expansion of this business model, um, which uh, is based on a low risk and low cost strategy, is through uh, uh, distributor partners. Uh, so we only have direct sales in a, a few number of geographies, essentially US, Mexico, Colombia, Australia, and Ecuador, which are uh, uh, very strategic for us. But otherwise, we have been selling 49 deals of the 54 through distributors across 15 countries, which shows the efficiency and in the in the expansion of this model. And given we are using distributors, the uh, cost associated to this is very low. Okay. And uh, to complete the answer, sorry, Mark, in terms of our competitors, uh, doing the same thing, well, definitely it can happen, but uh, we have a, a big distance and a big uh, advantage, and is that we have been selling a 100% cloud platform since we started the company in 2012. Currently, most of the competitors are available. They have, uh, in the market, they have client server uh, technologies requiring on-premise installations. They are partially migrating into cloud, 
but uh, they are mostly most of the competitors are more competitors are mostly uh, again a client server which means that they have to first of all a migration into a cloud platform and then acquire the experience of dealing with the cloud solutions which uh, for us uh, is is already a, a, a nine, an eight year experience and uh, then well we are taking advantage of uh, being first movers on those fields being fully web uh, and now in this kind of, of business model definitely we think it will happen uh, we'll have competition but uh, in the meantime we are planning to take advantage of uh, being first movers okay and then um what's the typical size of a, of a annual customer invoice and are the invoices generated in local currencies for everywhere you operate or do you you know bill everybody in us dollars or uh, some other functional currency and then um, how do they pay do they is it upfront or or um you know how how do you work credit control if you need to yeah in um, I mean, i'm going to use this slide because we, we have in in summary three streams for our revenue Aquila Costume, which has been our traditional business model, is a pure SaaS business model with multi-year contracts of, of five years in average. We don't charge anything at front. We just charge per tiers per month. So depending on the volume, um, the, the customer has to pay us a, 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 an agreed tier, which represents a, a, fix, a fixed monthly fee or, cost, or, or price. Um, if we jump into Aquila in the cloud, uh, this is a, a standardized solution with one to two years contracts. In, in LATAM, in general, uh, we use one year contracts. In US, two year contracts. And is based on a subscription model based exclusively on volume. So they have to pay a very small connection fee and then they will have to pay per, per transaction. Each, each study they deliver or they report or they archive is a transaction and uh, uh, this is counting for the uh, monthly charges that we uh, bill to the customer the other verticals uh, are, are are charged is essentially as aquila custom with multi-year contracts uh, and as a SaaS business model okay great and then the the software in general um have you guys built it all from scratch and own all the IP or is there parts of it that are um, open source? And if so, which ones are open source? Yeah, this slide uh, helped me to, to answer this question in a very simple manner. Everything with boxes in blue has been developed by our own team. It's our own intellectual property. The green boxes are third parties elements. Uh, from third parties, we only have the voice recognition, which is more or less a common scenario in our market. Uh, the main provider is Nuance. Uh, and in terms of advanced post-processing, we have two providers, Viral and Alva. But otherwise, the archiving system, the viewer, the workflow, everything, the AI uh, uh, we are offering currently has been developed by our own team. In terms of AI, we are planning to open for integration with third parties in order to accelerate the offer of uh, AI tools. And Bravis, to clarify, is a advanced tools for uh, post-processing of neurological imaging, it stands for brain visualization, and is a pretty sophisticated tool developed by our own team as well, uh, handling uh, functional MRI, tractography, DTI, this pretty advanced stuff in neuroimages. And then a, a, just a quick historical question. Um, why did you decide to list on the on the ASX as opposed to, I don't know, taking up a US listing or or or, or, a, or a, a, even a European listing? Yeah, well, uh, the main reason was that in during the private stage of the company, we received investment from uh, an Australian group, um, one of our. Uh, well, they, they, they invested in a company in the in the early stage. Um, after the growing rate and the behavior of the company demonstrated more maturity and more success, there was a suggestion from this group to present the company for uh, additional investment and potentially uh, listing the company in the Australian Stock Exchange. 
even there is a huge difference in the time zone and, and uh, in a, and, and a huge distance, geographical distance. We have seen that the ASX has been very friendly for us. Uh, the, there has been a lot of appetite for the size of the company, for the technology, for the future locking revenues, for the recurring re revenue, uh, recurring nature of the revenues, and the innovative elements um, we have been delivering. Uh, so it has been a fortune for us to be listed there. Uh, the, the, but the, the the main reason, the main driver, was that we uh, had private investment from Australians before listing the company. Okay, great, thank you. And then can you talk about the competitive landscape in the, in the larger um, centers, hospitals, compared to the smaller centers and uh, both of them kind of adopting um, Aquila, you know, what do they kind of see as the competitive advantages of it versus what they might have in-house or what they might be looking to change to? Yeah, well, uh, by the moment, we, we, we think that uh, Aquila in the Cloud is just suitable for the low end to mid end, given, well, the, the, the high end of the market requires customization and more specific functionalities. That's why we have reserved Aquila Custom for serving this segment of the market. In that, in that field, uh, we have all the functionalities required for, uh, for uh, being absolutely competitive. In fact, in LATAM, we have several uh, big multi-site um, uh, university hospitals. And with uh, the um, uh, in recent inclusion of Vital Advanced Post Processing, uh, Vital is a branch of Toshiba Canon, and we have done a global agreement with uh, them in order to provide through our platform um, their tools in a web uh, in a web uh, uh, product. Uh, with Vital, we are going even beyond the the average offer for the high end of the market. So we are not only very competitive, we are probably going beyond with uh, the advanced post processing. And in terms of uh, cost, we are very affordable and our, our deals are very cost effective. Um, this is a segment that during the pandemic has been a bit quiet because those big hospitals have been more focused on attending COVID related investments. But uh, we expect a reactivation during, to, during 2021 uh, of these kind of uh, big deals coming from big hospitals. Okay, and of the deals you've done so far, I think it was 54, if I remember from the slide. Um, geographically, are they you know spread right across? Or are they more focused in in LATAM? Uh, you know, where where would those 54 sit? I guess across the various geographies today. Sure, from the 54 new deals from Aquila in the Cloud, uh, three are from US. We, it's fair to say that we just opened the office in Miami in um, November, October, November 2020. Uh, we did all the incorporation of the subsidiary during the uh, initial two months. And uh, during the first month of uh, active sales uh, process or activities, uh, we delivered the first deal and early in this in, in 2021 we delivered two additional deals so three are from us the remaining 51 are from latam across 15 countries uh, which uh, which is a demonstration of the scalability geographic uh, and the and the geographic uh, well the the uh, how effective is in the geographic expansion this business model because in six months to to deliver 50 deals across 15 countries is a is a very efficient result under our view. Yeah, I think that kind of talks to the next question, Herman. Um, uh, typical implement, implementation time and uh, how labor intensive is implementation? Uh, and given, I guess, COVID, uh, I'm guessing most of it can be pretty much done remotely. Definitely. This is one of the, the, the reasons why we deliver this, given the travel restrictions and all the um, lockdowns related to the pandemic. Uh, Aquila in the Cloud was a reaction to all of these problems. 
In fact, a key in the cloud given, we only require a single real installation in the cloud and then just new tenants for each customer is a pretty single process, simple process. Uh, in fact, our deployment process takes less than 48 hours, but um, uh, the, the actual deployment process. We have measured an internal KPI since we launched, since we signed the deal until there is uh, actual usage of the of the platform and is around 50 days, but is, this is including all the contract sign process, uh, the pre, pre, uh, re, pre, uh, previous requirements in terms of infrastructure, internet connectivity from the customer side, but the actual segment of the deployment takes less than 48 hours for the Aquila in the cloud. Obviously for the custom, Aquila custom, uh, it depends on the size and the magnitude of the deployment, but uh, is um, is uh, around th three months the deployment process. Okay, uh, we've had one or two more come in, but uh, I'm conscious of time. We're we're just coming up on the the hour now, so Herman, I think we'll we'll just leave it there. If you could just go to the last slide with Francois' contact details, um, yeah. If anybody's got further questions, please. Uh, contact Francois um, at Citadel Magnus. I'll just say very thanks to Herman for 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 joining us. We uh, navigated the technical issues uh, in the end, and um, I'll wish everybody a, a good rest of their Thursday. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank yes. you everybody for making the time this morning. Thanks, Herman. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>